Hi everyone. In this part, we're going to see the interactions between the user land and the kernel land, how the syscalls are called. Also, we're going to see the different components, the executive components, as well as the kernel components and differences. Okay, let's get started. So this is a very simplified view of the separation between user mode and kernel mode, which people refer to as ring three and ring zero. But basically in user mode, you have a ton of services, user applications, and some stuff associated with the windowing environment. And a lot of what these programs end up doing um, actually goes into system DLLs, like ntdll.dll or userct2.dll. And eventually they'll, they'll cross over into the kernel, typically through system calls. So the main interface you interact with from userland is like an interface called executive layer. And so when you see something like eProcess structure or eThread, structure, the E stands for executive, and it is the high level, more complicated view of things. And the kernel itself deals with the lower level side of things where, because it's more, it's more interested in things like the scheduling, the memory management, and it will typically deal with more simplified structures like K process or K thread. And so the K in K process stands for kernel. And so typically an E structure will actually have one of its members, the first member being a, a K process. And so the same object can be used from either the executive part or the kernel part. But just when it's actually in the kernel part, it will just ignore the complexity of the E process part. So the executive layer actually abstracts things like access to the device drivers. So anytime you'll be working on Windows, you'll see a bunch of default system processes. The one mo most people are familiar with in general is Elsass, mainly because it's the one you target with a, a tool like Mimikatz to scrape credentials or hashes. And if you look at the processes shown by Process Explorer, you'll see also kernel threads them themselves that are like system services, but that won't necessarily have a corresponding user on process. They, they will always run in, in kernel. So generally knowing about some of these processes is useful from a kernel exploitation perspective because typically they will always be running with special privileges. So if, if you end up attacking the kernel and you want to pull out some kind of system level token, like a token with highest privileges, you know that for instance, Elsass will always have this kind of token. So if you can find an e-process structure, whatever process it is, and then walk through the linked list of processes, and find the e-process associated with Elsass, inevitably you can find a system token. So NTDL is basically the equivalent of libc on Linux, but this time for Windows. And so a lot of it is basically about abstracting access to system calls. So according to Microsoft, system calls are volatile and can change, and they often do, like the numbers associated with the system call often change. The argument can change sometimes as well. And this is why they say you have to call the APIs documented on the MSDN. And so NTDLL is implementing the system calls themselves, starting with NT. And so typically the functions you would call are from other DLLs like user32.dll or kernel32.dll. And so NTDLL on top of implementing the system calls is also responsible for managing the heap. And it contains a lot of C runtime functions like memcopy, or a lot of Microsoft typical functions to convert strings, etc. But generally, if you're interested in Windows kernel exploitation, you'll want to reverse engineer how the system calls are implemented, exactly how, how they are implemented into NTDLL. And this is because sometimes you'll want to trigger a kernel variety. And so for that, you'll need to call a system call, but the wrapper in NTDLL might have some sanity checks that prevent you from reaching the kernel side. And so in order to reach the kernel bug, you have to basically call the system call yourself by using the actual assembly instructions instead of actually going through the normal API and through NTDLL. So this is typically how you would talk to a driver from userland. You would start by calling the read file function from kernel32, the one that is actually documented on the MSDN, and that will call into NTDLL the actual wrapper for the syscall, the one starting with NT. And that function will actually end up calling the assembly instruction to, to do the syscall, which 
traps you into the more privileged mode which called the kernel side. And then depending on the file type you are looking at, it will know if, if it is associated to a specific driver and it will invoke that driver logic. So for instance, the actual read file implementation. So sometimes you are reversing code and it is unclear if you are looking at the executive part or the kernel part, but it's not always important. However, it's good to know that the two layers exist as sometimes Microsoft refers to one or the other. So you can think of the executive layer as the part that manages the processes, the threads, the system configuration, or the IOs in general. And the kernel layer is more about abstracting the hardware layer. And this is an example where knowing everything is not that important because I don't even remember what is the difference between a control object or a dispatch object. And so it's like we know all this information exists somewhere and it's, and it's documented and you can read about all the internals, but until you specifically need that information, it is not that important. It's more important to know that you need to dive into new concepts when you need them. So there is something called the HAL, the hardware abstraction layer. And you'll hear about it a lot when you're doing Windows kernel exploitation. But basically every computer has specific hardware, things on the PCI bus or, or whatever that are different, and they need to be abstracted somehow. So parts of the kernel can call fairly common APIs. And there are and there is this HAL layer that does all the hardware specific stuff. And so interestingly, the HAL is fairly well documented. And the main reason is because it's been abused for kernel exploitation. And so from a Windows kernel exploitation perspective, the HAL is basically dealing with a, a region of memory. And that region of memory contains a lot of interesting pointers like function pointers or pointers to interesting stru structures. And until recently, it was all at a static address. So typically exploit would abuse these, stru these structures. So if you're doing kernel exploitation, you can think of the HAL as a heap memory region that you might be able to abuse to get better primitives. But the actual HAL features and how it abstracts the hardware is generally not that interesting and it is more like a rabbit hole if you don't need to go that down that route. Win32K is the main driver for handling all the windowing functionality you're, when you're interacting with the desktop. It's probably the most complicated part of the Windows kernel, which means it has probably the most vulnerabilities. And interestingly, over time, like thousands of vulnerabilities have been found in Win32K that says, and still people are finding bugs in that component these days. However, because it has been heavily targeted, a lot of the sandboxes implemented now lock it down and prevent you from calling the system calls that dispatch into Win32K. So for instance, a browser sandbox like Chrome or Edge or Firefox or whatever, they would they would basically, at startup, they would, once all the GUI and window components are initialized, they would basically filter so you can't call any of the Win32K syscall or at least reduce the, the number to a really small number. So interestingly, even though you can still find bugs in Win32K, you won't be able to use them in practice for like useful scenario with something like after you get codification into a browser and you want to target the Windows kernel to get out of the sandbox, you won't be able to target Win32K anymore. So you will have to target other components in the kernel. And this is the main reason why attackers won't look for bugs in Win32K anymore. So this is an example of you trying to interact with the Windows subsystem. So for instance, the Win32K driver by doing some windowing functionality. And how it typically works is very similar to what we saw before for IOs. But basically you would call the well-known documented API in Win in user32 and it triggers some system call wrapper from NTDL. And then it calls the actual instructions to trap into kernel mode. And the system call will be associated with the Win32K driver itself as Win32K has a its, its huge set of system calls that it it supports and implements. And a lot of the time, which is kind of interesting and weird functionality, win32k.sys will issue these callbacks into userland DLLs, which lead to all sorts of crazy user after free bugs and problems. And it's kind of interesting and good to know because if you're actually debugging the Windows kernel, at first it can be a little bit confusing when you look at backtrace and you see that it goes from user DLLs into Win32K kernel drivers, 
into the kernel and then back into calling into user dealers again.